Hello, hello. Welcome to another edition of TK's Two Cents. I hope this live stream is finding you in a good place in life. I hope you're in the middle of creating uh, a great week for yourself, taking care of yourself, doing right by you. So much attention can go towards doing right by others, but what about doing right by ourselves? Remember, remember you are one of the people that you need to be good to in your quest to be good to people. All right, today I'm going to talk about greatness and the extra mile and what that means. And um, we're just going to dive right in with a couple of tweets today. So let's start with tweet number one. If your concept of being great doesn't involve the basics of getting enough sleep, setting healthy boundaries, practicing self-care, and following a strategy that honors your values, get a new concept ASAP. You can't go the extra mile if you refuse to respect the essential mile. You know, when I talk about the extra mile, I'm referring to all of the non-mandatory, extraordinary things that you can do in order to get a competitive edge or a creative advantage. So if you show up to the office an hour early, or you know, if you're on the football team or the basketball team or whatever team, and you stay late after practice, an hour after everyone's gone home, or, you know, if you're in math class and your teacher gives you 10 math problems and you say, but I want to be really good and I'm going to do 20 math problems, even though it's not required of me, that's the extra mile. That's the kind of stuff you need to do if you want to be bigger and better than the expectations of others. And, you know, greatness, it truly isn't mandatory. No matter how much other people expect of you, you have to give yourself the opportunity to know how wonderful life can be when you are primarily driven by intrinsic motivation. When you can say, all right, I know what everyone else expects. I know what everyone else requires of me, but what's the thing I need to push myself to do, even if it takes me out of my comfort zone in order to be the version of me that I respect? No good if everybody else is respecting you, but you don't respect yourself, right? That's the extra mile. But what often gets left out of the discussion is the essential mile. The essential mile refers to all of the things you need to do in order to protect the priorities that make your dream worth pursuing in the first place. The things like saying no to the stuff that's killing you, the things like making sure you're getting enough sleep, making sure you understand where your energy is coming from and how to how, how to nurture that, you know? It's like, let's take as an example, you wanted to master algebra. And you said, TK, what's the key? You know, what's the key to give me that edge to being good at algebra? And I say to you, all right, well, do you know how to do addition and subtraction, multiplication and division? And you say, no, 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 but, but I, I want to get to the algebra stuff. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down. Slow down and master the fundamentals. I know that the extra stuff is glamorous and that's the stuff that gets people's attention but you can't sustain that extra stuff unless you master the essential stuff. And the essential stuff is the stuff that makes it worth doing in the first place. And it keeps you alive and keeps you healthy along the way. You know, I think about that verse in the Bible that I quoted before, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world, but to lose their soul? The essential mile is the stuff that you need to do to make sure you are nurturing and protecting your soul. So it's good to focus on the more, what more can I do? But you can't do more unless you do what's necessary first. So don't forget about the necessary stuff. You know, I've coached a lot of people who said things like, hey, how can I, uh, you know, create extra value at work? How can I make sure I'm the best employee at my company? And the first thing I say is completely master your job description. Completely understand what is expected of you, what you are getting paid to do, what you have agreed to do, and absolutely crush that. And then when you've got that down, do the extra stuff as well. And I say that to you about whatever it is you're trying to pursue in life, whatever your dreams are, make sure you are respecting the essential mile along the way as you're doing the extra mile. Now, I do have a challenge on this, and uh, I like to address questions, comments, whether they are challenging or whether they're just you know asking for advice on something. So I want to address one of the challenges that I got because I think it's a great opportunity to bring out some, some nuance that Twitter doesn't allow. This comes from Jake Stiles. Jake Stiles says, largely agree, but 
like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs and many others that would be considered great, surely do not practice that. Surely didn't practice that. Well, just the, the, the first little sidebar I want to say is that I, I think most of us don't practice this. You know, most of us give lip service to it. Most of us recognize that it's valuable in theory, but I, I truly don't think most of us practice this. But let's go ahead and assume that that's true. Let's assume that Elon Musk or Steve Jobs didn't practice that and they managed to be great anyway. This isn't my main answer, but one thing I want to say that is that doesn't mean that's a good plan for you. For every healthy practice I can name, there is an example to be found of someone somewhere who gave the middle finger to that healthy practice and still managed to succeed according to some kind of metric some way. That doesn't mean that what they did was healthy. It just means that in spite of doing some unhealthy things, they were able to make a lot of money or have a lot of fame. But I actually want to challenge this understanding. I actually don't think it's true that they didn't practice that. I actually think people like Elon Musk and Steve Jobs, regardless of how much they're stereotype, actually did practice exactly what I'm talking about. You know, one of the interesting things about people that society dubs workaholics is that when, when, when we look at people who find a lot of fulfillment by working really hard and just like getting after it all the time, people that don't have that personality type can be confused by that. And they, they, they often don't have any vocabulary for understanding that apart from, oh, you're an unhealthy workaholic. And one of the easiest things to do in life is to assume that our priorities are the same as other people's priorities and that what's unhealthy for me is unhealthy for you. Uh, and, you know, one example of this was, you know, in The Last Dance, Michael Jordan just talked about how winning was everything. And what are we taught as kids? We're taught as kids that winning isn't everything, right? We're taught to have fun. You know, it doesn't matter as much if we lose. And this was a guy who took, took losing very personally and worked extra hard to minimize the amount of times that he lost. But that was his competitive drive. That's what made the game meaningful for him to play. Doesn't mean you need to be like that. It just means that you need to do the hard work of figuring out what it means for you to set healthy boundaries and do the things that are important to you. So I want to go back to this original tweet and, and I want to point out some things about it. And then I want to point out why I think people like Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, and, and the people that we often dismiss as being unhealthy actually are doing this and what you can learn from them. So let's go back to the original tweet and see what it's actually saying. The basics of getting enough sleep. Okay, how much sleep is enough? I know some people who are completely dysfunctional if they don't get 10 hours of sleep. I know some people that have trained their bodies to get five hours of sleep and they seem to be fine. So what's the right answer? Well, we can you know look at some scientific report and say a human being needs this much sleep. Okay, let's assume that that's right and there's a single right amount of sleep for everyone. Well, we still have to compare that against something else. What are your priorities? How much sleep do you need in order to optimally function? And then how much sleep do you choose to prioritize based on what you are putting first in your life? And that's your decision. Every one of us has to come up with the answer to that question for ourselves. What about setting healthy boundaries? You know, what boundary is healthy? I'll tell you what's healthy for me. For me, it's spending 90% of my time away from people. I grow weary of people very quickly. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, I hate people, I don't like people. I'm extremely comfortable around people. I'm very social. I enjoy people when I'm around them, but I tend to get drained very quickly. Being around people tends to pull energy from me more than it does put energy in me. When I'm alone, however, I feel amazing. And at no point in my life have I ever been alone and felt like, ah, oh, I'm lonely. I wish I had more people around. In another life, I could be a total monk. But to most people, that sounds like a pretty boring, depressing lifestyle. But I don't know boredom. I don't get boredom. So a healthy lifestyle for me or a healthy boundary for me might be not being around people that much. You know, um, whereas for someone else, a healthy boundary might be making sure they are setting aside time to be around people and have, you know, interactions with them. Practicing self-care, following a strategy that honors your values. Again, these are all things that are subjective. Like when it comes to the specifics of application, you have to do the hard work of figuring out what all of these things mean for you. And what's interesting to me about people like Elon Musk and Steve Jobs is they tend to be much better than the average person 
at looking out for themselves, at prioritizing the things that matter to them. In fact, they tend to be so good at it that they are often very offensive to other people who believe that they ought to have a different set of priorities. And people like that, you can't manipulate them with guilt. You can't go up to a Steve Jobs and an Elon Musk and say, you ought to be doing this with your money. You ought to be giving your time to these people because they need you the most. You need to be spending your creativity solving these kinds of problems because these kinds of problems are more noble. And these guys are so good at taking care of themselves that they are willing to be the villain in your life in order to be the hero of your own story. And they will look at you and say, nope, you're not going to manipulate me with guilt. I'm going to prioritize the principles that I live by. I'm going to prioritize the preferences that I have, the passions and the mission that I have. So they take care of themselves. They just have a very different definition of what healthy boundary is. They just have a very different definition of what value system is. And we all have different definitions of that. My value system isn't the same as yours. So I often make reference to what I call the three Ps. What are your preferences? What are your priorities? What are your principles? Taking care of yourself and what it means to do that are gonna be determined by what those three things are for you and they vary from person to person. All right, let's go to tweet number two. But before I do, tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern time, I've got Dr. Kelvin Echo in Elko in the house. And Dr. Kevin's gonna be talking with us about the language of winning. And uh, for my sport fans out there, he is a 30 ring holder. He's got 30 Super Bowl rings and NCAA rings combined. He's worked with multiple sports teams across the country and is a highly respected figure in terms of optimal performance, in terms of taking charge of your mindset and redesigning your life. And he's helped a lot of top performers um, implement these kinds of principles. And so tomorrow he's going to be telling us some of his favorite stories about working with different sport teams and athletes. And he's going to be giving us his philosophy of success and what it means to adopt a language of winning. So please tune in. 12 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow on the Revolution of One live stream with Kamau and I. All right, let's go to tweet number two. Do you have the courage to demand great things of yourself? Do you have the courage to demand great things of yourself? You know, let me actually uh, expound on this by, by, by taking a look at some of the tweets. You know, the, the reason that I posted this is because I just wanted people to think about what it takes to actually push yourself to get to another level. Because if you wanna just stay where you are, that doesn't really take any courage. In fact, it's far more likely for you to fit in if you just kind of stay where you are and you don't push yourself. But everything in life that causes you to stand out, everything in life that causes you to live up to your potential comes from having the courage to push yourself. It comes from having the courage to challenge yourself. And sometimes we, we sort of reduce the idea of self-love and self-care to just accepting yourself as you are. We're so afraid of people burdening themselves with guilt. We're so afraid of people feeling bad when they fail that we often try to protect them from failure, which is the very means by which people learn. And that is something that needs to be balanced with the idea that, yes, who you are right now is OK in the sense that you don't need to beat yourself up for not being everything that you want to be. But who you are involves your potential as well. And being true to yourself means not only loving yourself as you are, but pushing yourself to become more. You can't be true to yourself unless you're true to your potential. You can't, you can't just say, I'm going to stay where I am. I'm not going to learn anything new. I'm, I'm never going to develop a new skill. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat myself as if I'm in some final idealized state, and that's being true to myself. That's not being true to yourself because you're absolutely rejecting a big part of yourself, which is your innate capacity to evolve. And you've got to honor that part of yourself if you really want to be true to yourself. I got a lot of comments on this one, so uh, let's take a look. One of them come from, comes from Bitcoin SV is the reality. And uh, the comment is demanding something on oneself sounds crazy. I do sound crazy sometimes, so I completely own that. Let me tell you why you'll uh, use the word demanding. Uh, I'm not going to argue that it's the right word. I don't think there's a right word to use here. I can give some alternative suggestions if that word demanding rubs you the wrong way. 
But I'm going to tell you why I personally like it more than I like any other word for what I'm talking about here. I could have used a word like request something, you know, request something great of yourself or, you know, um, ask something great of yourself. But here's the difference between a request and a demand. When I make a request, I'm acknowledging that you have the right to refuse my request. And I'm acknowledging that I sort of have a duty to respect your right to refusal. I am asking for your cooperation, but I'm appealing to something that is essentially non-enforceable and, and something that is negotiable. A demand is a, a little different. A demand is when I set something forth as being non-negotiable. When I give a demand, I'm not asking. I'm not asking. I'm not making a request. I'm not saying it's okay if, if you don't do this. I'm taking all alternatives off the table and I'm telling you this is how it must be. Now, you can't go through your life just making demands for everything. You know, I, I think the overwhelming majority of life ought to involve you making respectful requests to people for their cooperation. But there are some things in life that you absolutely can't treat as being negotiable. And one of those things is your potential. So I say make a demand on yourself in the sense of allow yourself to experience the unique form of greatness that comes from saying, I will accept nothing less than a lifestyle in which I am dedicated to my potential in the best way that I know how to be. So that's why I use demanding, but I won't debate that word for one second. If that doesn't work for you, throw it out and use something that resonates with you. Invoke something of yourself, summon something from yourself, request something of yourself, pick whatever word that works for you. All right, let's go to the next, uh, next tweet here. This comes from Burst Angel 75. Burst Angel says, too tired too tired, TK. And if you feel like that, and if you ever felt like that, someone says, do you have the courage to challenge yourself to be great? It's like, man, not today, bro. Not today. None of that motivational stuff today, man. I'm too tired. Well, my response to you is the same as it was to Burst Angel. Let yourself rest, my friend. The ultimate greatness is when you can honestly and freely honor the priorities, preferences, and principles that are truly yours. This goes back to that first tweet. If your concept of greatness is limited to, oh, I gotta work all the time, I gotta push myself all the time, and it doesn't involve resting when you need to rest, doing what you need to do in order to be healthy, then get a new concept of greatness. You know, we cannot allow a word as beautiful as greatness to be hijacked by people who are so limited in their thinking that they only see greatness in terms of like, you know, working themselves into a heart attack. What a shallow, superficial notion of greatness, right? Like greatness is so much better than that weak understanding of the term. Greatness is about you doing what you need to do to become the healthiest version of yourself. And if, and if that means taking a day off, if that means turning off the Tony Robbins because it's irritating you and instead listening to some music instead, do whatever you gotta do. Now, Burst Angel responds back to me graciously. Thanks. I wish I had the energy and positivity, but that is even exhausting for me. People are very draining to be around. Wish I could live in a monastery, but I love your work and outlook in life. Hey, I, I kind of wish I could live in a monastery too. I don't know if you heard me at the beginning, but I truly think in, a, in another life, I could be a really good monk because um, I just love being alone. But let me say this. I don't even think you need to be positive. I don't think you need to have my energy. I think you need to have your energy. But I don't even think you need to be positive. Life isn't about being positive. It's about being present with who you are. And it's about allowing whatever you are feeling to, to teach you and to observe those feelings from a state of blameless discernment, from a state of non-judgmental compassion. That's the only way that we get the healing that we need in life. There's so much talk out there that makes us feel like emotions are the enemy. And that what we need to do when we feel a so-called negative emotion is to push past it as fast as possible or to overcome it. But emotions aren't there to be overcome. Emotions are there to be processed in a way that is healthy and at a pace that is right for you. So sometimes it may take you longer. Sometimes it may take you uh, less time. But it's about processing your emotions in a way that's right for you. I don't believe that happiness is the goal of life. I don't believe that positivity is the goal of life. I believe that emotional versatility is the healthiest psychological state. And I simply define that as a state in which 
you are not treating any of your, your feelings as an enemy, and you are at peace with everything that you feel, and whatever the emotion is, you are processing it in a way that is healthy, and in your time, at your pace, you are harnessing it in a way that is constructive. So do you, be you, don't lie for the sake of positivity, don't deny who you are for the sake of positivity, don't pretend to be happy for the sake of some guru who says you need to be smiling all the time. Blessings, my friend. All right, let's go to the next next comment here. This comes from Nine Digit Eric. Nine Digit Eric. Nine Digit Eric is always up for a good conversation. I, I, I love uh, my dialogues with you. Now, when I said in that original tweet, "Do you have the courage to demand great things of yourself?" Nine Digit Eric said, "And the corresponding guilt for perceived failure." That's a big one, right? That's a big one. And, and I actually think that's one of the reasons why it takes courage to demand great things of yourself. And it's one of the reasons why we hold ourselves back because we know that we're not perfect. And one of the first things that happens when we demand great things of ourselves is that we try to do those things and we fail and then we end up disappointing ourselves. So what's the solution? Never take risk so that we never have to feel guilty about failing? No, it's learn how to deal with your guilt with the healthy mindset. It's not about avoiding the possibility of failure because you feel guilty for it. It's about learning how to cope with that feeling of guilt. So my response here was, do you have the courage to demand greatness from a place of grace, not guilt? Do you have the courage to judge yourself only by the standards of God's purpose for you rather than the world's status games? That's a big deal. Nine digit Eric, sometimes yes, I find that even from grace I fail at times, I'm trying to find the right tension of doing nothing from selfish ambition or vanity, but also being bold in the spirit to have the right conceptualization of great. That is absolutely on point, and that is the key to this. The first move you need to make towards greatness is not go to the gym. It's not pick up a self-help book. It's not agree to work a few extra hours at the job. No, the first step towards greatness is thinking critically and creatively about what greatness means for you. Because really, great people are willing to deviate from mainstream thinking, from groupthink, from the herd mentality when it comes to their own understanding of what it means to be great. In fact, you look at a lot of people that society praises as being great, which often happens after they're gone or after they've retired or after they've finished their journey. A lot of those people, they spend their entire lives making everyone else around them really nervous or really worried. Are they gonna turn out okay? What in the world are they doing again? They're so confusing. For every person that does something great, there's someone else that's looking at them wondering how, why, and when my old buddy from high school went off the deep end. So in order to be great, you gotta define your own conception of great. And you gotta make sure that it's a healthy conception. And you've gotta leave some room in your concept of greatness to accommodate from guilt. A lot of that guilt from failing to achieve something comes from a place of thinking that I am what I do rather than I am the spirit that does it. And it comes from a place of doing things from a consciousness of lack, which is my value comes from what I accumulate or what I achieve rather than a consciousness of abundance, which is my value already exists as a person created in the image and likeness of God. And I am doing these things in order to creatively express that which is already within me. And so my value is unshakable. You know, um, when you create from that state, when you grow from that state, when you pursue greatness from that state, you're not really dealing with all the guilt, you know? All right, let's go to the, uh, the last one here by Jim at Elemental Money. Jim says, I often yield to the demands of others, but fail to demand things of myself. Any thoughts on that? And I says, got a specific example that can help me get a clearer picture. Jim says, I'll stay late at the office to get a project done, but I don't always put in that kind of effort on my personal projects. You know, one of the, one of the problems when we do things like this is we often assume that our value is a reflection of our opportunities rather than living as if our opportunities are a reflection of our value. What do I mean by that? Well, when you live as if your value is a reflection of your opportunities, you see the company that you work for or the people that you hang out with or the person that you date or whatever it is, you see that as being where the value lies. And you're not very valuable, but 
oh, it's such a such a privilege to be able to work for this company, such a privilege to be uh, friends with this person, uh, so lucky to be dating this person. The value is all in the other person. And the reason that you're valuable is because you get to be a part of this thing. Now, you should absolutely be grateful for the people in your life, for the opportunities that you have, but you got to have a little self-respect here. And you got to understand that you would not be in the position that you are in unless you brought some value to the table. And that person that's friends with you, that person that's dating you, that company that hired you, even if they said, I'm going to give you a chance, kid, it's because they saw something in you that was worth betting on, that was worth banking on. And you've got to remember that. And when you remember that, you start to look at the opportunities in your life as a reflection of your value, not the other way around. And you start to say, well, the reason I have all these amazing possibilities, the reason I even have a job that I'm staying late at the office for is because there's something about me that makes this place more valuable. And that's when you start to realize that your greatest investment is you. The greatest investment is you. And if you want to increase opportunity in life, you don't do it by chasing people around and begging them for more opportunity. You do it by increasing your value, increasing your knowledge, increasing your skill set, increasing your level of, of self-confidence, which comes from increased competence. That's how you do it. And so, you know, I, I, look, look at your job this way. There's nothing wrong with staying late at work. If you're passionate about a project, it's a priority for you. I know some people will treat that like it's a sin. Well, look, if you stand at work, gives you a heart attack, then stop staying late at work, okay? But there are some people who are okay with that. And if you're okay with that and, and, and you're, you're valuing the work that you're doing, go ahead and do that. But remember, wherever it is you want to go in life that is beyond your current occupation, that's gonna come from investing in your own growth outside of work as well. So set aside that time to do the things that matter to you, to study the things that matter to you, to develop the skills that matter to you, to work on those projects, because the reason that you have that job in the first place is because you are valuable. And, and, and don't work out of fear. Don't, don't, don't treat your job like, oh, if, I, if I'm never the last one to leave, they're gonna get rid of me, and then I'm not gonna be able to do anything else. No, if you keep investing in yourself, then you'll never be in that position. Um, you may be in a position where you go through some challenges, where it takes some time to find opportunities, but if you keep investing in yourself, you'll gradually transform yourself into the kind of person who's able to always create an opportunity. So, hey man, start small. I know you're busy with work and everything like that, but start small. Um, every day, set aside something like 15 minutes to work on your own projects and commit to it just like you do with your job because you understand that that, your own growth, your own projects is just as valuable as the things that you get a check for. And you're never going to get paid for that stuff unless you do that stuff like you're getting paid before you get paid. So respect your thing, man. Respect your projects, respect your purpose, respect your own time as well. That is it, my friends. I look forward again to seeing you tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern time for the conversation with Dr. Kevin Elko. Please don't hesitate to send in questions, make comments on the tweets or anything along those lines. Even if I didn't get to them today, put questions in the comments. I love to uh, take a look at them in the future and talk about whatever it is you're interested in. All right, everybody, have an awesome week. Pursue greatness and exercise the critical thinking necessary to follow the essential mile before the extra mile. Peace.